Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into glute. I could argue that this muscle group is the most universally loved and desired to have. I would agree with that. And I would actually add that it's probably the most poorly trained. Well, let's go ahead and help out with that then and dive into some glutes. Let's do it. Diving into the glutes, there are going to be three main glute muscles that we're looking at. So there's going to be the glute maximus, the glute medius, and the glute minimus. And it's going to help with extension at the hip. It's also going to help with internal and external rotation of the upper leg and abduction. So that leg, upper thigh moving away from your body. Well, I think it's going to be best to dive into each of those sections a little bit more. I wanted to just set the foundation of what all is going to be included within the glutes and the function of the muscle before we get started. Absolutely. So do you want to start with um, the daily activities? Yeah, I think that's always a great way to really showcase what it does because we can always look at the aesthetic of a muscle and it's something where you and I are very passionate about the aesthetics of the muscle, but I think it's so helpful to understand what that muscle does. So we can also look past just what that muscle looks like and really being able to take that into our function of how we go about our day-to-day -day life. So one that basically everyone does is walking. So it's going to help out a ton with walking. What are some other things that your glutes are going to help out with? I would say jumping and sprinting would be other ones where they're going to be very large contributors, but even on a more specific day-to-day -day activity, it's going to be a big part of you standing up out of your seat. Mm -hmm. Or even like climbing stairs is going to be a portion of that. And then of course, if we use that within strength training, uh, but think about how you might be bending down or squatting down to grab something, pick up your child, uh, your legs and your glute muscles are going to be involved in that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just going to be involved in such a large part of your day. The amount of time that you're spending either walking, sitting and standing into a seat, I mean, it's going to be a contributor in you having balance and stability as you sit back into a seat and you don't just plop down. Like mm -hmm. having strength in your glutes is going to allow for you to lower in more of a controlled manner, which I would say that all of us, as we get into a seat, aren't trying to just like fall into <laughs> it. Um, so that's going to be helpful. It's just, I mean, it's a ma major contributor to your entire day. So it's something that if someone doesn't want to grow huge glutes or want that visual appearance of huge glutes, should they still train their glute muscle? Of course. I, I mean, you aren't going to just all of a sudden come by these massive glutes. You've got all of these individuals across the internet who are trying to get you to just grow your glutes a little bit or to feel your glutes in the mm -hmm. slightest bit. So by having the glute stability or just a base level of strength is going to be beneficial for everyone. It would be one of the major muscle groups that I would encourage everyone to train in some capacity from the time that they start training to the end of their life, because it's going to be so helpful for them in overall pelvic stability. And we can kind of talk about some of the benefits or the reasons why from a life perspective that we would want to be training glutes. It's just going to be a big part of the puzzle. Yeah. Like you said, that pelvic stability and also just your hip stability and hip strength is going to be a huge mover in that. And we already talked about the things that they're like your daily activities, but it's worth repeating of just being able to walk, being able to climb stairs and do so in an efficient matter, manner using the correct muscles, you are going to want to be able to have glute strength. And especially speaking to how much we're sitting on a day-to-day -day basis, it's going to be a muscle group that is going to quickly atrophy if we're not putting resistance on the tissue. So you see this a lot with individuals who go from playing a 
athletic sport in college maybe, and then they go straight to being in a desk job as they conclude their time with um, being in that sport. And they see themselves get to a place where they're having a lot of lower back pain mm -hmm. and you see that they're having to tighten their belt so tight that it's <laughs> going, their pants are gonna fall off of them because they have no glutes to hold them up anymore. A lot of those things are going to transpire. And especially as people get older and they're not resistance training much at all, this is going to be a place that they need to really start to see a lot of the general discomfort that they would be experiencing through their lower back, through their hips, um, be alleviated by creating that strength and that stability. And just your overall with your legs, if you are a woman and you plan to get pregnant, it is going to be extremely important to be able to have glute and leg muscles and tissue to be able to carry your stomach as it grows, just be able to keep you upright um, and ensure that you're able to just be in a good spot as you go through the whole pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So very, very important, all age ranges for everyone. Good deal. <laughs> so what about that visual appearance? What are we gonna see when we grow those bigger glutes? I would say that this increases your likelihood of getting a boyfriend or a girlfriend. <laughs> I would say that both genders are interested in having some pretty decent glutes. Um, I, I know that a big part of physique development is glute growth. So I'm seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis, new clients coming in, current clients wanting to see their glutes grow. So I am at a biased viewpoint for this particular muscle group. Um, but I will say that uh, globally, this is going to just improve the overall appearance of your physique. Uh, I find one of the biggest downfalls, I see this more with men, where they are, they have no glutes to them whatsoever. And then it just makes the posterior portion of their body look so odd. And it's just like one line from their hip down to their ankle, and they can't keep their pants up. It's just, it's just not a well balanced look. Um, so I would encourage male and female to, from an aesthetic, from a function, from all the things that we've already talked about, glutes are going to be tremendously important. Yeah. And you just get to have that dump truck, which is always a great, great feeling to have. But I will say within growing your glutes, some things to take in mind, and I will specify this towards women, just because I know that men struggle with this in a different way, I'm not going to necessarily say less, but as if you want to grow your glutes, recognize that your clothing size may have to change as well. That's something that I didn't necessarily take into consideration. And my dresses started to get a lot shorter on me. I actually recently got some skirts that I'm going to have to return and get in a different size because they fit my waist, they fit me, but because my glutes are bigger, which is something I want, then it pushes the fabric out. So then the skirt is a little bit shorter than I'd prefer. Uh, and so it's just something that I always like to mention because people talk about wanting to grow their glutes and then get really in their head when their jeans don't fit, their shorts don't fit. And that could have been in the past something that was due to you gaining weight in a way that you didn't like how you looked. But this is something where I try to remind myself of what my goals are and then what those things can happen of, hey, yeah, having bigger glutes might make it that my shorts fit a little bit tighter or snugger. And I might need to change sizes there. But that doesn't mean that I've let myself go or changing my clothing size is the end of the world. Because it's also something, unless you are an influencer on the internet, constantly talking about your clothing size so other people know what size to order, no one knows what size you are, nor do most people care what size you are wearing. And so that's always really comforting to me is when I see someone looking really great, I'm not like, oh, I wonder what clothing size they're wearing. I'm just like, oh, they look great. Good for them. You're very rare. I mean, I don't, there's 0% chance you're just going to be walking by someone on the street and be like, what size pant are you wearing? Mm -hmm. Like no one has ever asked me that question, nor do I ever think that's going to come across. And I've never seen it be asked to you from just some random person on, yeah. on the street. Um, I will say from a male standpoint that I have to go up in a waist size for pants and then I have to get the waist tailored. That's just, I mean, that's been the last, I don't know, five or six years to stay something that I prefer of how my body looks. Thus, I have to make some, I guess, 
sacrifices of spending a little bit extra money going to a tailor, so on and so forth, uh, to have pants that fit me properly. Or if I really didn't want to go to the tailor, I would just have to like fold the edges of my waistband to be able to, you know, have it fit. It would look a little weird, but <laughs> could do that. Yeah. So you got to think about the trade-offs, what's worth it for you, and then being able to go from there. But let's go ahead and break down each glute muscle to be able to uh, go over the form and function um, and how that's going to work for each section of the glute. When we look at the three muscle groups that are going to make up the glutes, the largest and most superficial for us to be able to see is going to be the glute max. And we're going to have this split into two portions today. You have some camps like N1 Education who has gone the extra mile and separated this into three sections and become very specific within exercise selection, specifically to each division um, that they have labeled the glutes. But for today's purposes, we're going to look at it as two separate divisions. We have the upper portion of the glute max, and this is going to be responsible for the external rotation of the upper leg, as well as the abduction of the upper leg. And then we have the lower portion of the glute max, which is going to be more responsible for the hip extension. And as we go through different exercise selection later on through the episode, you'll be able to have different setup to target either the upper or lower division of the glute max, which will be interesting to dig into. Yes. And as a Note, we also have a cheat sheet down in the show notes. So if we're talking about things, maybe you're taking notes, but you might be commuting to work or listening to this while you're on a walk and not have the availability to take notes. So we took care of that for you. There's going to be a cheat sheet in every episode. So you're able to see where the muscle is going to originate, where it's going to insert. And there's also going to be a playlist of each exercise so that you can know exactly how to perform it and have all of that information at your fingertips. So don't forget to download that down below. Two functions that I would add or expand upon as we talked about the hip extension, being the strongest hip extender, it also is going to be a large contributor of just being able to stand upright. Without it, its contribution, we're going to see uh, misalignment to the spine or just slouching and so on. So having the strong glutes allows for us to stay standing more upright. And then it's also going to support the upper leg as we're extended at the knee, which I think is important to, to note as well. 100%. And going into the glute medius, also known as the glute med, this is going to be something that's more of a fan-shaped muscle, and it's going to be kind of in between the maximus and the minimus, and it has a lot of similarities to the minimus, which we're going to dive into here in a second, uh, but it is actually going to originate on the pelvis and going to insert on the upper leg or on your femur. And with this, it's going to do a lot of that abduction, and you might hear us say things like a abduction. I know that it's pronounced abduction, but when you're saying it, sometimes adduction, abduction can sound very similar. So I always like to make it as clear as possible. But abduction, abduction is going to be moving away from the body, thinking of like if someone is abducted by aliens moving away as a whole. Um, so it's going to move that thigh away from your body. And it's also going to uh, medially and laterally rotate the lower limb. So again, sharing some duties with some of the other glute muscles here, but it really helps steady and secure the pelvis when the opposite foot is raised off of the ground during walking and running, and as well as stabilizing with the same leg when your foot is planted. So it has a lot of important roles for things that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. A small spoiler to some of the exercises we're going to speak about later on is that we have a, a glute med kickback that uh, we have a lot of our clients perform. And one of the things that is often uh, feedback the first time that they do it is that they feel it a lot in the supporting hip. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what the case is where that opposite leg is having the support to the pelvis to create the stability, as well as that leg is elevated and moving through motion. So then that opposite leg glute med is under a lot of tension by having to do that stabilization. If you're not training the glute med a lot, you're not going on runs, you're not getting into this deeper lunge position that they're having to stabilize in those positions where the other leg is lifted, you're certainly going to be getting a stimulus to that opposite leg if this is a very novel 
uh, stimulus for you to experience. So if you are in that camp and you're like, man, my other hip feels like it's getting the brunt of this, it could just be something where we have to work through some repetitions. And it also obviously could be that you're not performing the movement correctly, but if it's really early on and you doing it, then that's probably the case. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because I hear all different things about why someone is feeling that pain on the opposite leg, but I feel like you really vocalize that very clearly and especially with us talking about what it does. And that's why being able to learn about or even just seeing the muscles and how they connect or how they work together, then you can kind of place those things together in your head and make it make more sense when you're training and you feel pain or you feel discomfort of like, hey, why is this happening? And if you look at what the glute med does, it's like, oh, this makes a lot of sense as to why this is happening. Absolutely. So the the last of the three that we have is the glute minimus. This is going to serve as a greater stabilizing muscle group rather than a main mover like we've talked about within the glute med and the glute max. This is going to run directly under the glute medius and is going to be contributing to the ad abduction of the upper leg, the abduction of the upper leg. And that's really going to be its main duty. It's also going to be contributing to stabilizing the pelvis when walking or running. And so it's going to be, as it is running directly under that glute med, going to be contributing to a lot of the actions that the glute med is uh, performing. So think of them kind of as in tandem almost. So if someone were to be like, what's the most important of the glute muscles to train, what would your answer be? What's the goal? Exactly. I think that's a great answer because I think that people kind of get honed in on whether it's Instagram or different things on social media of do this exercise to grow your glutes or you have to do this. This is how I saw the most improvement. And it's like that could be an exercise that's great to do and could be really great for glutes. But it's also something where we want to be able to think about individuals of what they need to change within their training, what they're biased towards, um, and what they have already seen improvement in. And so really being able to hone in on that more, I think is a, a great thing to look at. Yeah, it's going to be very specific to the, the goal that is needing to be completed or wanting to be completed. If we're looking at a competitor who is getting on the bikini stage and wanting to be at the top of their game, they're going to need to have a global approach, but a lot to that glute maximus being developed, especially that lower division as we want to see that length, but also the density towards that lower glute as they get into their back pose. And then also you still want to have that upper glute be very well developed and having a shelf to that glute. Whereas if I I have someone who's coming to me as a uh, lifestyle client or a mom who is wanting to just simply function better, maybe wanting to run better. I may have a little bit more of a over like a global approach to how they're going about their exercise selection, focusing on maybe more um a deduction than what I have with that um bikini competitor who's really focused on having a large bias to their glute max, where in the lifestyle mom, I may have more balance to what's happening anteriorly to the pelvis or more just within the glute med and the glute max and so on. So it's just really going to be dependent on the goal and what needs to be accomplished and where that person's at. Because it more often than not, you're going to have something that has been biased in the career of you training. Like when people come to us, they've been training for X amount of time and they've been trying to do glute movements, but oftentimes it's only going to be a portion of that glute max that has been trained because they stay in that plane of motion or they stay in that positioning of the upper leg. And so then once we get into a place where we're training in different positions of that upper leg, that's where we really see a breakthrough of seeing that complete glute be very well developed. And I can look at a, a an individual. I've seen you know thousands of photos, not tens of thousands when I'm looking at them weekly. And I can see what is lacking within their training or what is lacking within their ability to contract or create tension to that particular portion of the glute um, by just looking at 
what I see in front of me on a picture. Mm -hmm. I know you recently shared a transformation with me that was a mom and she was struggling with saggy butt. And that was something that she was really trying to fix. And I, I can't remember the exact time frame of the pictures, but it was a very noticeable difference that you were able to do. Was that something like if someone is listening and like, oh, I deal with like really saggy glutes, what would be the thing that they would need to focus on? I would say nine times out of 10, someone comes to me with saggy glutes, which is often. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of improving exercise selection and exercise execution more than anything. And so going through on a week to week basis within their check-ins to be able to evaluate what's going on within these exercises, because we've gotten to a place where the do's and don'ts on social media of this is exactly how to do this exercise. This is not how to do this exercise. Those are valuable to the broad stroke individual. But now we're getting to a place because those do's and don'ts videos are so abundant that everyone's tried it and we're still having individuals with issues in performing the exercise and targeting the muscle group that they're trying to target. Well, now we've got to get into the specific weeds of what's going on with that person. And that's really the difference that one-on-one -on -one coaching provides when someone understands the anatomy, understands the actual function of what we're trying to accomplish within the exercise, not just if you're you know, picture like this person and your picture like this person, do it like this. We have to be able to adjust the cues to see what clicks for that particular person because not everything is going to click right away and it may just be a different phrasing of it or a different setup to put you in the spot that you need to be in um, because there's just different ways of talking about or cueing a client to do a particular action. Um, and so that's really where that one-on-one -on -one touch comes into as well as the expertise and repetition and so on. Um, but that would be the, the big thing. Yeah, and I think that it's also taking into consideration just body structure of different limb lengths of one cue for that one person could end up being different or the exercise looking different on a different person just because their body is set up in a different way. And if we're just trying to look and we see one person do it and then we see ourselves and we're like, it doesn't look the same or I'm not feeling it the same, it could just be that you might need to do it a little bit differently or cued a little bit differently to truly get it for you because we're all individuals and unique and all that jazz. <laughs> low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You, you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great. You for should your squat ass for grass. Toes. It's fine. It Macro fits my macros. Is for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. So you've been hinting at it. Do you want to go into some of our favorite exercises that we use for glute training? We can. Uh, we've got a, a lot of exercises that we can, can cover. How do you want to uh, kind of break these down? How about you tell me your favorite to personally perform? My favorite to perform, I think, would come down to these would be my top three. Um, I would take the split squat as probably number one. This has always been a favorite of mine. I enjoy the suck of this particular <laughs> movement. I like the uneasy feeling that I get going into heavier sets of split squats. Um, my second would probably be the RDL. A bent knee RDL would be um, second there where I feel like I get a lot of great tension where it's needed to be in that particular exercise. And then number three, I am really enjoying the the drop lunge as one of my options, but I probably should pick something that's not lengthened bias because the two exercises that I just labeled were uh, very lengthened bias exercises. So then I'll go with the 45 degree hip extension as my favorite 
shortened biased exercise. I'm really surprised that you didn't include step ups in there because I know that's one that yeah. lights you up. Actually, I'll I'll remove and just I don't even care. I'd rather have all lengthened exercises <laughs> anyway. Um, remove the 45 and then put the step up in there. <laughs> I was just talking to someone the other day about the aspect of split squats and how that's helpful to have a coach because if I were doing my own programming, I would never just program split squats for myself. Um, but it's something that you, on the other hand, would program for yourself because you are kind of um, satanic in that of just, I want to absolutely die during a, a leg training session. Yeah. I mean, there's been phases of training for me that I only have like maybe two or three exercises on my lower days. And I just go balls to the wall, redline myself on every exercise. And that those are some of my most fun training sessions. Mm -hmm. I'm out there for almost 90 minutes, just cranking on three exercises. Um, doesn't happen all the time and certainly is not my, <laughs> you know, what I would do every single week, week after week. But there's just some weeks where that is necessary and it's a blast. <laughs> Well, I would say that one of my favorite exercises is going to be the glute bias leg press, just because, and especially we have the Cybex squat press, and I love that thing. I love, love, love how much stability I have and how much I can truly focus on output as I'm going through it. And I just feel like it's set up very well, like where if I'm doing barbell back squats, you can bias your glutes in that. But because of where my limb link is, if I'm not using something like a, um, like the super squat bar or like a, a camber bar, then it's very difficult for me to bias my glutes more. And so being able to be in a spot that I have the stability and I can still get that lengthening portion in the leg press is absolutely stellar for me. But I have recently, well, since I've started the PD glute program, become a very big fan of the glute max kickbacks. Those are some that I have a ton of fun with. I feel like I have got the setup nailed down and I have really worked on being able to get to that full hip extension because I was struggling a little bit. Um, within just where my hips were at to get to that. But now that I've got the exercise figured out, then I love doing that one as well. Absolutely. I, I mean, we can really look at this as more glute max specific exercises. Then we can kind of look at this as the few that we would have more of a glute med specificity. Would you want to kind of break that down for everybody? Sure. Okay. So when we talk about exercise selection and we can think about hip extension in the more lengthened position. So think of this as, or the tension being at its greatest at this particular portion of the exercise. And so I'm gonna break all these down. So we have the, the RDL, which is going to be at the bottom when the dumbbells, the trap bar, the barbell is closest to the floor and your hips are pushed all the way back. That is going to be the lengthened position uh, within hip extension or training hip extension, the glutes specifically in that exercise. So that would be kind of you know one of our exercises there. We have a hip dominant squat. We have a split squat. We have a um, leg press. We have a like a, a drop lunge mm -hmm. would also fit into that category. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing from the top of my head here? Squat variations, hinge variations, these things are going to be majority of what we're yeah. looking at. Lunge variations. Right, the lunge variation, same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna be more of our lengthened uh, bias. We don't have as many options when it comes to a shortened bias when training through hip extension. Really all we're looking at here is going to be the glute max kickback that Sue was speaking to. We have the 45 degree hip extension. And then we also have the uh, glute bridge or hip thrust that is also going to be accomplishing that goal. So if we're trying to train the glute max and we're trying to increase overall hypertrophy, we're going to want to pick exercises, a majority of the exercise that we're performing from that list of lengthened biased exercises. That's going to be our bread and butter of being able to grow our glute max, um, specifically that lower uh, half of the glute max, getting a lot of love uh, when performing those movements. You still want to perform the movements that have a shortened bias in hip extension, but the lengthened bias is going to be where you're really getting the most bang for your buck, if you will, when trying to grow your glutes. Mm -hmm. 
Now, we're also going to have exercises that are going to be training kind of like a, a hybrid of sorts, um, which would be that drop lunge. So the drop lunge, if done properly and you are striding back with the opposite leg more towards your midline, not just stepping back, and we're keeping our hips facing forward, we're not rotating with the hips, that's going to allow for us to target not only a portion of that um, glute that is going to be contributing to hip extension, but also part of that glute that's going to be contributing to uh, the abduction of the upper leg. So that's going to be a movement that is really, really good mm -hmm. if you feel like you're lacking some of that upper glute. Other movements that would be similar to this would be lunge variations. If you were to be holding the dumbbell in the opposite hand of what leg is forward in maybe a split squat, or the drop lunge that I just spoke about, that portion of the glute max is going to be getting a little bit more love. So those movements would be really, uh, would be great for you to perform. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at exercises that are going to be challenging more of the lengthened position to that glute med, our list is fairly short. Um, we're going to see lateral lunges have a contributing factor here. So we would have some glute med being a contributor on that. And then also as we do walking lunges or reverse lunges, they're going to be contributing in that action as well. We don't have great exercises to train that glute med more through the fully lengthened position. What we have seen is that through a glute med kickback, this is going to be, depending on the setup of the cable, if we have the cable set up um, at a higher point and we allow for that leg to really sweep across and, and maintain tension on that glute med, that may be the answer. We have to keep the pelvis um, sitting straight. We wouldn't want the pelvis to rotate towards that cable as the leg is pulled across. We'd wanna stay stable and that would create a more lengthened uh, position for that glute med, but then we would have the glute med as we're kicking the cable away that the glute med kickback would be training the glute med through that shortened position. So like I said, our list for options when it comes to training the glute med more directly is not going to be quite vast, but it is going to be a contributor as we work through some of the other exercises that I talked about that are more biased towards that hip extension that are going to be contributing factors. Awesome. Lots of great information there. Now, is there something I, I see a lot of people doing like the hip abduction and adduction machines um, in the name of growing their glutes? Would you say that those are going to be very helpful in your glute training? So the hip abduction machine, I think is going to have a contributing factor. Is it going to be the best way for you to be able to train the glute med? I don't believe so. I find that if you're able to have a laid back variation, like if there's older ones where it is at an incline that you're able to sit further back and have the hips be more extended and then go into the abduction, I would believe that to be a better situation. Um, there's going to be some contribution. You see a lot of people doing like a lean forward variation and holding on to the um, machine. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be okay, but I would still say that the, the laying back variant is a better option if you're trying to find a machine-based exercise to perform. Gotcha. What about, what is the exercise that irks you the most when you see someone performing it as far as their execution? I would say any squat or RDL variation that they're just like bottoming out the exercise and either going ass to grass on the squat or taking the bar, the dumbbells, the trap bar all the way to the ground and saying like, this is the only way that you can get to lengthen glute and then just like dumping it as they're going through the eccentric portion, that is probably the most annoying thing to me because it's not a destination that you're, it's not point A to point B, it's finding what fits best for you and your structure. And so it's not just like going as until your body just like crumbles under the bar. There's going to be a point where the glutes are in a good position to be able to contribute to the actions. And then at some point we're going to get out of that range and we're going to have to shift some of that to other muscles groups because of where the positioning of our bones and our body are. And so we have to understand really where those lines are created. And that comes down to just being more aware of how we're moving through exercises and finding those positions. Yeah. I think that a lot of times people think more range of motion is always going to elicit more tension or more bang for your buck. But sometimes it can honestly just be something that's causing you back pain and or causing you to exert energy 
energy that you could actually be using towards more attention if you didn't just focus on a destination or more range of motion altogether. Are there any exercises that you see? Oh, you already know. The thing that irks me the most is when I see a split squat and first if they have like a super high bench that they're using it on, I'm like, you're not getting to where you need to go here. But more than anything, it is when the top of their foot is on the bench instead of their toes on the bench. Because if we're really talking about pelvic stability and truly being able to get the most bang for your buck, having that foot flat, that's it's just like a dead fish there. You need to be able to have it up on your toes to be able to have that pelvic stability and really push through to get the most out of it. So that's the thing that just grinds my gears a little bit. Of course, I always understand people are learning and growing and evolving within their training, and I'm not going to act like I've never done that before. But it's probably the thing that when I see, I immediately just want to like pick up their foot for them and be like, here, this will help you. Well, I think that part of it is that people don't have the necessary equipment to potentially do that. Mm -hmm. So what would you advise someone who is trying to get set up in the way that you're speaking to, um, but they only have the bench per se? Um, they only have a bench. They have no other equipment. I mean, they're obviously going to have other equipment in the gym, but what they're familiar to okay. is that they've used a bench for the split squat. What would you advise that they use? Okay. I just want to make sure I was giving them the right direction. I would say that if you have something like some DC blocks, which are just going to be like stackable blocks at your gym, I would say that if you have like those soft padded boxes, um, like that go to the different heights that people use to um, like do box jumps on, depending on the type. There's ones that are very soft and there's ones that are a little bit more firm that those could be an option because you want it to be stable. It's kind of like if you're squatting, would you rather squat on concrete or on a bed? And it's like stability wise, I'd rather squat on concrete. And so if you have DC blocks, if you have one of those padded boxes that is um, more sturdy or even like, you know, those little like um, they're like they're not benches. They're like the little square, like they're like, they kind of look like stools, but they're different sizes in the gym, something like that. Anything, even if you have like a bumper plate or two, being able to give you some elevation, but not putting you in a spot where a lot of those benches are so high that it's pushing you into a spot that your pelvis is like at an angle because you can't like the bench is too high that it's hiking your hip up. And so you need a lot less elevation than a lot of people think when they're looking at something like a step up or a split squat or anything like that. It's that we're looking for a few inches here, but it doesn't need to be all the way to our hip. Yeah. I mean, all you need is enough room for your knee not to run into the ground mm -hmm. is basically all we're trying to do. And then you could also add the treadmill to that. Yeah. Um, treadmills can be a decent option. I know there's some taller ones like the Woodway or the Techno Gym that are much taller. I'm not speaking to those. Like a more normal treadmill is going to maybe be a good option. Um, the treadmill wouldn't be on, just an FYI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just in case someone's like, what's this new way to do it? Well, I'm just that would be know. on them. I, I do not take responsibility <laughs> for thinking they need to turn it on before they started their split squat. Just let them know. To have their back foot up on the, <laughs> on the outer edge, not on the tread of the treadmill. <laughs> Just trying to help people out here. That was fascinating. If any of you thought that the treadmill needed to be on, please. Please let me know so I can yeah, let, let Alex us, know that that was a good you. disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> what other ones? Uh, as far as exercises that I see mistakes in. Sure. Um, I would say we already talked about the range of motion for the RDL and the lunges and then the split squats. So I would say that the next would be when people do like leg press and they're like, I got to go high and wide. And that is the way to target glutes. Mm. So what do you have as advice for them? Mm -hmm. That you do not want to go high. <laughs> uh, you want to be able to bring your legs more in line with the width of your hips altogether. And then as far as them being higher or not, what we want to think about, it's going to depend on what the angle of the leg press is. Because it, 
and it also depends on if the plate that you're putting your feet on rotates or hinges or if it's completely stable. Because what we want to think about as we are going into that position that we're lowering those legs is that we want to think about that knee being in line with that ankle to be able to allow us to have the most lengthening to our glute as we go through it. Instead of if our legs are really high and wide, then as we start to bring the plate and the weight down, then it puts us in a spot that our like ankle is way in front of our knee and then we're not able to get to that full lengthening position of that glute. Yeah, I think with the the glute max, it's wrapping around the femur. And I, I think that if we talk about the the leg press and getting set up, we want to be narrow. And then you can think about taking that inner thigh and trying to bring it towards your chest. If you're thinking of it in that cueing, the thing that we're trying to thereafter avoid is now the, the pelvic rotation because that's you're losing pelvic stability by going more narrow. And one of the, I guess, benefits that you could say of being wider is that your pelvis is very stable. And so people will say, I feel a lot stronger. It's not because your glutes are necessarily contributing more. It's because you have the adductors being a huge contributor here. The quads are playing a little bit of a role depending on how much knee flexion we're getting. A portion of the glute is going to be contributing to the action as well. But when we are able to go a little bit more narrow, that's going to put us in a position where we're getting the most glute max involvement. And then we're bringing that upper thigh towards our chest while keeping the pelvis from rotating. And so you're only going as low as that is allowing you to, to have. And then we want to make sure that as we get to that bottom position and the thigh is close to our chest, that we have uh, basically that straight line that Sue referenced from the knee to the ankle. If we have the ankle sitting higher than the knee, we probably have our feet too high and we can bring it down a little bit. Um, that's something to, to make note of. Uh, and also it's if we're trying to create that glute bias, we don't have to be at the very tip top of the foot plate. I want to make that abundantly clear. And going back to finding that bottom position and being able to draw a straight line from that knee to the ankle being a really helpful tool. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. So are there any other exercises that you see mistakes on or even just training mistakes in general when it comes to the glutes? A ton. Um, like I said, this is probably the one that <laughs> is the most messed up, if you will. Um, what I would probably add if we want to go into kickback variations, kickback variations being very limited to either one position or just flying through the exercise, just absolutely taking the cable and generating as much momentum as humanly possible and just using the leg as like a swing lever. There's no actual muscular tension that's being created. We're getting a little bit at the very beginning when they're generating all this momentum, but the point or, or the goal of the a, a kickback variation is getting, if we're talking about glute max, getting into full hip extension and being able to train them in that shortened range. So the end of that exercise is what we're trying to maximize and create a lot of tension and be able to hold that spot. I cannot count the amount of times that I have been sent glute kickback videos. And it is the tons of, of force being generated at the very beginning. And then they're just sweeping the leg and they touch what is the most important part for a microsecond. And it just swings back. And we're just living off of momentum. That's just continuing to be transferred from point A to point B. And so 
a very easy cue here is that from our starting spot, being a little bit slower, similar to what we would teach within the leg extension. And as we're kicking the leg out, we're slow to get started. And then as we break that 15% or 15 degrees of, of knee extension, we start to accelerate. The same thing would apply within the glute me kickback, within the glute max kickback, and having control of the cable is much more important. And <laughs> I can just keep going <laughs> with the, the kickback variations. They find or often people are putting this in like 15, 20, 25 repetitions in a training. And so then they're being forced to rush through it because they can barely count to that high. And so I would even bring down the repetitions just so that you can get better at the actual exercise and the movement pattern. And then if you're still wanting to apply in higher rep ranges, go for it. But if you're learning the movement pattern and you still haven't gotten to a place where you're getting a whole lot of bang for your buck out of the exercise, it is a waste of your time to do 15, 20, 25 reps. And especially if you're someone who's saying like, I don't feel it until rep 15. It's mm -hmm. like, that's a problem. Yeah. You're just getting to the place of fatigue and saying, okay, I feel fatigued, thus I'm done. It's like, that's not what we're trying to do. You're not going to create higher hypertrophy gain from just simply creating fatigue at the muscle. I'll have you go walk for 24 hours. I'd be very tired, but no hypertrophy is going to happen. I expended a lot of calories, but I didn't grow any muscle tissue. Like we can do all kinds of things just to make you more tired. If your goal is to be tired, we can do a hundred different things every day. That'd make me very tired, but I'm not going to have any hypertrophy. And so the lack of, of understanding of what the actual goal is when trying to grow a muscle group is probably the largest issue in this column um, of muscles to train. That's with everything, but. Yeah, and you obviously talked about momentum, but even just like the speed within going through the exercise, because that's something where I had a client and onboarded her. She had a lot of things and a lot of boxes checked. And it was something where I was like, I'm, I'm kind of surprised she hasn't seen the progress she wanted to see. And then I took a look at her training videos and she was just absolutely rushing through each exercise. And we really talked about what it looked like for tempo and just being able to, even if tempo wasn't involved, how to have control of the actual weight that you're moving around and the amount of size that she was able to see added on in just six weeks and then 12 weeks was crazy just due to she was already going to the gym. She was already tracking her macros. She was already checking so many of the boxes, but it was something of actually having intention and intent within what she was doing and understanding it more that she could see those results where she felt like she had been spinning her wheels for seven years going to the gym. And it's like, that would be very discouraging going and training that frequently that often and not to see results. And so being able to, if you feel like you've just been spinning your wheels and been checking those boxes, then it might be of like, let's take a deeper look at the exercise selection. Let's take a deeper look at your execution, your intensity, your intent to really be able to make sure that you're not just wasting your time because that stinks. Yeah. And I, I think one of the other factors of that is just being more efficient with the time in the gym. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many people that come to me and say they're training glutes three days a week, two days a week for an hour and a half at a time. And then I'm able to cut down their sessions to two sessions a week at 45 minutes a session. And they're making significantly more progress than what they were when they were training three days a week. And it really does come down to doing more specific things and doing those specific things significantly better than you've ever done any other exercise before. And if you can do that, then you're going to catapult your results. Mm -hmm. um, but it does require you to take a step back in your, mm -hmm. in your mind, whether that be from a load selection or that be from the total amount of volume that you're performing per session. Like there's a lot of different things that you're going to have to view and understand that it's a regression to take 10 steps forward because you've been taking these micro quarter steps for years now. And it really has gotten you nowhere because you'll take the quarter step and then take two months off. And now you're taking three steps back and you've been in this just back and forth. And now we can actually actually see real progress for the first time. And it's going to be tough at the beginning, but the reward is, is far beyond what you've ever experienced. Yeah. It can be really hard for your ego too, of like, okay, I can lift this much and that's really empowering, but then you're having to go in there and select a lighter load. And it's like, ugh, if only these people knew how much I could lift. And it's like, Hey, it, 
it doesn't really matter how much you can lift if you can't control that weight, if you can't feel tension from that weight. And the more that I recognized that, the easier it was on my ego of like, hey, I'm here to actually have tension on the muscle and grow the muscle instead of just trying to prove to other people of what I can do. It's like, Again, I, I'm the one living in my body. I'm the one with these goals for myself. I'm the one who wants to look this way. I should be paying attention to that and what's going to bring me closer to it. Um, and that can build such a foundation. Oftentimes, uh, when clients come to me, I start them off with being talking through of like this first phase, we're really focusing on execution. And you might have to change around some of these weights, but I want to see videos. I want to go through this. And some of them will get a little bit impatient. But once we move down the or nail down those movement patterns, it's game over. It's like, okay, now we're seeing results. Now we can go and do everything that we want to do because we just took some time to get this nailed down. Did you go last for the training mistakes or did I? Um, I think that it was you, but I kind of jumped in there. Go ahead. You can go, <laughs> you can go next. Um, I would say that, um, I would like kind of going into an exercise that people struggle with is something like the hip thrust or the glute bridge is that I'll sometimes get clients saying that they're feeling it in their quads too much or they're just not feeling it in their glutes altogether. And I think a large portion of that comes to the setup of how you are set up in the movement overall. But then again, it comes down to the intent um, and how you are going through the movement because I will have some people that their setup might be good, but then as they go through the movement, they either are like dumping their hips as they go down, or they're not actually getting to that full hip extension. And I'll just say like getting the full hip extension, especially in a hip thrust or glute bridge is difficult, but that's kind of the point. Not of, kind like, of, it is the point. <laughs> it's the point that that's where the exercise is the hardest, but that's also where you're going to see the most growth in in what you're trying to do. And so people cut themselves short of like, oh, I can do this much load or look at me do this hip thrust. And I'm like, you're not getting to full hip extension. So you're literally missing out on the main portion of doing that exercise. Yeah. If, if you are having your legs too far out, you're going to be feeling it more through your hamstrings tension wise. And then if you have your feet too close to you, you're going to be feeling it more through your quads. And, it, and also if you're doing more of a hip thrust where you're taking the barbell all the way down to the ground and resetting, you may be feeling a lot through your quads because the knee is traveling behind the ankle as you sit back. And then you're also having to use your quads to kind of drive that knee now forward. And depending on where that ending position is, if you get to that end range and now your knees are past your ankle, well, then your quads are getting even more. So you're going to feel a lot of sensation or burn towards those quads. But as you are driving that knee forward, you're going to be getting more quads there as well. And so you may be feeling it through your lower back and your quads. If you're doing more of that scoop nature or, or getting the barbell down to the ground. How I like to teach this is that I want to start, if someone is is has done it a certain way before and hasn't had a lot of results with it, and I'm wanting to get them into it or they've never done it before, I start in the same spot. And what I do is that we focus solely on hip extension. I mean, we are in a very small range of motion where the knee and the ankle are, I mean, they're glued. We, are, we have a straight line the entire time. We allow for the hips to come down. And then as soon as we get to a place as before that upper or that knee is to travel back behind the ankle, I stop and we stop there. And it, it really is a short range of motion. This is going to be more considered a, a cast glute bridge as well. And so we work through that small range for them to really feel getting all the way into extension. You're probably going to have to decrease load to do this, but this is a great spot for us to start in because then once we are able to progress past this, we can get a little bit more movement to that upper leg and allow for the knee to slightly travel behind the ankle to get a little bit more range of motion, maybe a little bit more recruitment of other muscle groups that are going to be contributing but when we're focused on keeping that shin angle vertical the entire time, it is a shorter range, but it is almost exclusively glutes, which is what we're trying to accomplish in the movement to begin with. Um, now, the other thing to also add is that the hamstrings are going to be at the, as your knee is at that 90 degree angle, 
or your knee is flexed, you are going to have the hamstrings contracting. So you're going to have some tension or feel some sensation towards those hamstrings because they are working. They're stabilizing the upper leg. And so it's not a matter of like, well, I feel my glutes and my hamstrings. Yeah, you're gonna feel some hamstrings being involved there, but we want obviously a prioritization or a, a biased amount towards those glutes throughout the entirety of the movement. Do you have any other training mistakes that you see? Um, I would say within the step-ups, people catapulting themselves uh, off of the back leg and having too large of a box to where as they go through the eccentric portion, they have control for about 0.3 seconds and then it just becomes a dash to the very bottom. And then they use that as momentum to kind of bend their back knee more and then catapult themselves back up. And they go through this sequence and they're like, why do I feel it through my quads? And I'm like, I don't know, man, look at you performing it. Just watch the video. Um, that is annoying to me. And I find that a shorter step box height is going to be a better option, but also having the support of a, like a something in front of you to have extra stability so that you can have even greater control through the eccentric portion of the exercise is going to be your absolute best option, in my opinion. Um, because the eccentric portion of a step up is probably going to be your largest bang for your buck in that particular movement um, when it comes to glutes, being able to push the hip back and maintain tension as you lower the load, because that's where we're going to have the lengthened bias in that exercise. And so if we're able to control through the eccentric and even get to the bottom and have that control without having our, our foot placed on the ground quite yet and be able to hold that and have a lot of tension in that the leg that is elevated, that's where we're going to really reap the benefit of what a step up can do. Well, I love to hear it. Do you have any last ones? Are you ready to go into some rapid fire about glutes? The last one I kind of already touched on, but I would say that with lengthened bias exercises like the squat or like the RDL, just making sure that we're living in that bottom range and not rushing out of it or bouncing out of it. Because again, that is where we're going to see the growth. Mm -hmm. And that's where, again, you want to give up on yourself of like when I'm in a squat, when it gets to the bottom, I kind of want to cut it short and come back through because it's hard, it's challenging, it's scary, but that is exactly what you need to do. And what Alex always cues me in that, he's like, just trust yourself. It's going to be hard, but trust that you can do it. And that helps me a ton of just recognizing like once I accept it's going to be hard, literally all I need to do is trust myself that I know what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, rapid fire. Are you ready? I think so. All right. Will the Stairmasters build my glute? No. <laughs> Why are glutes important? This doesn't seem very rapid fire because they are. <laughs> the, the list is too long, I feel like. All right. Can you grow your glutes without weights? No. Which deadlift targets glutes? Conventional. Why is the sumo deadlift not the best for glute hypertrophy? Too long of a question. It isn't the best option. <laughs> <laughs> How do I engage slash activate my glute muscles? By doing the exercises that we talked about. All right. <laughs> <laughs> not by doing banded hip abduction. I mean, you can use these tools. Yeah. They're, they're simply tools. Do you have to do them before every glute session? No. It would be something that you would build off of to be at a point where you're able to get into the exercises that you have planned for that day, doing warm up sets, and then being able to execute. Like I personally, there are things that I like to do before I get into leg sessions that are exercise related. I like to do a couple of light sets of the 45 degree hip extension. It feels good to me after sitting all day. It feels good to go through a full range of motion through the hyper extension. And then I like to get into the lying leg curl. Again, after a long day of sitting, I'm going into train legs doing a couple of light sets on the lying leg curl and getting into a fully contracted hamstring and then getting to a fully contracted glute is just a great start for whatever I'm doing for lower body training. Is that to say that I'm using it as an activation exercise? Not necessarily, but my glutes and my hamstrings and my lower body in general feel better after performing them. So if you want to put it in that category, by all means, go for it. But I don't look at it that way. Yeah. And just a quick note on bands is that they honestly might be hurting 
helping you depending on you as an individual and what your structure is. Because for me, putting a band around my knees and then doing the hip thrust with that, that's actually not going to help my personal hip thrust because of certain things I'm working on. It might actually help me more if I were to put a block in between my knees and try to squeeze it together instead of trying to like push out on the band. And so unless you understand why you are using that band and not just doing it because someone told you it's how you activate your glutes, then that's something you need to take into consideration because I have a lot of clients, again, coming to me with these preconceived truths that they have like believed for themselves of I need to do this because I saw someone else doing it, where that might still be something good for someone to do but maybe not for them. So that's how I always try to be careful about it is not saying, oh, band work is bad or band work is stupid. There can be a lot of, quote, bad or stupid things depending on the person and how it works for them. So it's just something where I ask you to question what you're doing and why a little bit more so that you're not just spending time doing something you shouldn't be. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for this glutes episode, and we'll catch you throughout the rest of this muscle series.